I have a confession to make. Some of the confession is already out there, having dripped through what I've said on here over the weeks and months just past, but I should be more frank. For most of my life, I was unaware and therefore silent about so much that's wrong. Events unfolded and I was too busy in my own little world. I missed what was happening for much too long, but not knowing is not enough. Ignorance is no defence. Just the other day, someone mentioned The West Wing, the US drama series about the fictionalised goings on in the White House. I watched episodes of that show more than once over the years. We have the box set. Now I can't look at it at all, and I doubt if I will ever look at it again. Sounds like a silly detail in the scheme of things, but The West Wing is one of many trivialities I can no longer bear, because each is a reminder of a bigger problem. The West Wing belongs to that time when I took it for granted, just as a for instance, that a Democrat White House meant the good guys. But that was then, and this is now. It's not just the West Wing, of course. There are whole piles of movies and TV shows I can't look at now because the sight and sound of them makes me cringe with the memory of my naivety and my downright dumbness during the years when I enjoyed them. Admitting naivety and dumbness is a damned hard bullet to chew. So much of what's wrong in the world is moving faster and faster. But all those neoliberal stooges in their tiny, tiny suits with their good hair and hundred grand wristwatches, the ones that all went to the same sort of schools and belonged to the same sort of private clubs that were mentored by the same elderly ghouls and so have the same connections to the same transnational entities and corporations, all those identical placemen and women pretending to care about equality and diversity, while focused only and always on playing their parts in securing yet more wealth and power for others like themselves. All of them are running scared now, and for good reason. The internet helped them enormously. Indeed, the grab for power and mountains of cash during the past three years would not have been possible without it. But the internet is a double-edged sword, and double-edged swords are sharp on both sides. Never before have so many of us had access to so much information about all that's going on. Those neoliberals, those neo-feudalists like to brand everything that doesn't help their cause as misinformation. But they would say that, wouldn't they? More and more of us have rumbled them, though, those proto-tyrants and many dictators and they know it, and it's already too late for them to put the genie back in the lamp. And so all they can do is take more and more liberties, pass more and more legislation to let them build the walls they hope will protect them protect them from us. It's like a supermarket sweep, as they hurtle up and down the aisles, desperately piling anything and everything into their trolleys before their time runs out. And so Emmanuel Macron slips his luxury watch off of his wrist and into his trouser pocket on live TV while he thinks no one's looking. And after making it illegal to film and share footage of the French police in action as they beat French people with batons and spray tear gas into their faces, the mainstream media there, here and elsewhere, pushes the line that the French peasants are revolting in the face of changes to the pensionable age. What arrant nonsense. This latest unrest in France, this revolution, is hardly about pensions. Have you seen the age of the protesters? Twenty-somethings who surely care not a jot about what pensions they may or may not receive in four decades' time. This is the continuing war by the yellow vests, those regular people sick and tired of everything Macron stands for, who see through his hollow cant about egality and diversity all the way to the heart of what's really going on, which is to say a desperate last dash for the power to crush and silence dissent. No wonder he had to cancel the visit by King Charles. To lose one king off with his head is unfortunate. To lose two would be downright careless. Here in the UK, we're careering through the cost of lockdown crisis led by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, a man richer than that king, a veritable poster boy for the hedge fund class with all his ties to big money and bigger business, a man who cheers on digital currency, a man whose father-in-law owns Infosys, a company behind all the tech necessary for central bank digital currencies, digital IDs and a social credit system. In the US, where former President Donald Trump has been indicted, President Joe Biden's administration desperately goads 100 million Americans, going to any lengths it would seem to provoke some or other insurrection that will justify further draconian crackdowns on opposition. When the might of the US state is focusing so much effort on coming up with a reason to arrest a focal point of that opposition, a person really does have to wonder about the state of democracy and justice in the so-called land of the free. Former Speaker Nancy Pelosi said on social media last week that Donald Trump was entitled to a trial, and I quote, to prove innocence. 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time I looked, a person living in a democracy was presumed innocent until proven guilty. I believe a faux pas like Pelosi's is described as saying the quiet part out loud. Maybe she should extend the same entitlement to Joe Biden and his family and have them prove they're innocent of dodgy dealings in Ukraine and China and elsewhere. What's sauce for the goose, after all? And if there's a walking metaphor for the moral and cognitive decline of the West, then surely it's Joe Biden shuffling from podium to podium, plainly wondering where he is and why. As if we needed more proof the powers that be have lost their way, that they are without any moral compass, whatever. There it is in the evident dementia of the 46th President of the United States of America. US Vice President Kamala Harris has been in Africa on what they call a charm offensive. Alarmed by the growing influence on that continent of other powers, she's there to talk to Africans about the importance of democracy. Since she represents a US that has toppled multiple governments in Africa over the years, this takes some chutzpah or perhaps just unmitigated temerity and unparalleled gall. In Canada, the strutting popinjay that is Justin Trudeau awarded himself emergency powers to crush the truckers' protest. Remember the truckers' protest? Including freezing and seizing the bank accounts of the truckers and those supporting their efforts. But the truckers are still there, just as the farmers and their tractors are still on the roads in the Netherlands. And those yellow vests are still out and about in France. And the people of Israel, those same people explicitly used as the laboratory of the world during the pandemic, are out on the streets of Tel Aviv and elsewhere. I said the internet was a double-edged sword, and I meant it. More and more people are talking about and worried about AI, artificial intelligence, and rightly so. No doubt chat, GPT, and the rest of whatever tech is coming down the line will put even more people out of a job. Many predict an existential threat for the species, and maybe they're right. Sometimes, though, I think AI is just the same old, same old, made unimaginably fast and voracious, drawing upon everything our species has learned so far and repurposing it, reflecting back at us in a fraction of a femtosecond the distillation of what it took our ancestors millennia to learn. And then sometimes I wonder if fast is all it is. I was beaten out of arithmetic by the first calculator I encountered 50 years ago. Computers are faster than me at everything under the sun. And I'm still here. Like the rest of us, AI is living inside the body of a whale. There's plenty for it to eat for now, but only because there was a whale. At the same time, good old Homo sapiens Mark I is stubbornly continuing to evolve, the better to adapt to its niche. Don't stop yourself celebrating stubborn and resourceful Homo sapiens wherever you find him or her, here in the UK, in the United States, in France, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Africa, in the Middle East, everywhere. Between 1811 and 1816, skilled tradesmen rose in rebellion here in the UK to protest the loss of their livelihoods to machines. Weavers took to smashing looms that put them out of a job. Those rebels are remembered as Luddites. In 1812, the Tory Prime Minister Spencer Percival made frame-breaking a crime punishable by death. Lord Byron spoke against the move. It was his maiden speech in the Lords, and he used it to lament how a once loyal and industrious body of the people had become miserable men driven by nothing but want. You may, rec you may call the people a mob, he said, but do not forget that a mob often speaks the sentiments of the people. Neoliberal stooges with the right connections pretending to care about the people but only focused on securing more wealth and power for others like themselves are as nothing in the face of those who have right on their side. I was blind to what was going on for most of my life. I admit as much freely now, but it seems to me it matters to say so. If the world around you just feels wrong at the moment, if it makes you uncomfortable in your skin, it's not because you're going mad, but because you know the difference between right and wrong, and so much is so wrong. It's absolutely not the job of governments and leaders to make so many people so unhappy, so frightened of the future. It's utterly wrong that meaningful influence is in the process of being ceded to transnational bodies comprised of unelected, unaccountable placemen and women, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum. It's time to assess whether they're fit for purpose, NATO, the United Nations and the rest. Any and all groups can and do go wrong, and when they do, it's the responsibility of everyone to say so and to do something about it. The internet is a double-edged sword and cuts both ways. The rich and powerful plainly do not understand the new tech of social media, failed to see it would empower not just them, but all of us as well. American comedian George Carlin 
looked at those in power in his own country and said, it's a big club and you ain't in it. It might be a big club in terms of power and money, but its members are few in number. We are many and we are right while they are wrong and in the wrong. We know it and deep down, they know it too.